This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. So um, I probably should start with talking about where, how we got to this point and introducing a bit of history. Um, 50 years ago, Gareth, uh, Gareth Hardin described the tragedy of the commons where people acting in their own self-interest inevitably will deplete or spoil a common resource as each acts in their own self-interest. He argued that the tragedy can only be prevented by private property rights or government regulation. And yet, within the last 50 years, we've discovered exemplar counterexamples where altruism trumps selfishness. So let's look at the business case behind one of these examples, the, the open source movement. And one of the things that we're finding is that despite governments and businesses acknowledging the value of open source software in politics and initiatives over the last decade, and despite numerous attempts, they rarely achieve the level of collaboration experienced by open source communities. So why, why is that? Looked at through the lens of traditional management, open source collaboration is time consuming, it's imprecise, unreliable, hard to manage, rarely addresses short term objectives and hard to quantify in a business case. And yet, in a digital economy, collaborative communities regularly out innovate and out compete closed or centrally controlled initiatives. So backing successful collaboration with traditional business requires us to write compelling counterintuitive business cases which explain and justify the elusive practices of collaborative communities. So this presentation that I'm going to give here is explains the subtle magic of open strategies in business terms and will help will hopefully help you convince your boss to back these strategies. I'm going to focus on open source software, but the principles translate across all types of creative commons, um, open data, open government, open standards and, and other open approaches. So this is what we'll be covering. The, we'll be covering the digital economy, complexity, trust, motivations, innovations and obsolescence. Now, the first thing to recognize is that the digital economy has fundamentally changed the rules of business. Ignore this at your own peril. Zero duplication costs and the connectivity of the internet has led to wicked complexity, rapid innovation, and on the flip side, rapid obsolescence. So let's start by talking about complexity. Software systems have become huge, interdependent and complex. It is no longer possible for one person to understand all of a system's intricacies. Solving problems requires the collective brain power of many people. So to understand this, we'll introduce the Kenavan framework, which describes how different decision methodologies should be applied at different levels of complexity. This framework is broken into four decision-making domains. The obvious domain is, where, is the area of known knowns. The relationship between cause and effect is clear. Establish the facts, categorize, then respond. By, and, and you respond by following established rules and applying best practices. This is the province of standard operating procedures and legal structures. But beware of complacency, oversimplification, or creating volumes of processes and unwieldy wieldy red tape. The complicated domain is the known unknowns. The relationship between cause and effect can be determined from analysis or expertise, and there is a range of right answers. What you need to do is assess the facts, analyze, and apply the appropriate good operating practice. This is the province of experts, but be aware of the trustworthiness of the advice or influence from vested interests and 
be careful about balancing short-term versus long-term goals. The complex domain is a domain of unknown unknowns. Cause and effect can only be deduced in retrospect, and there are no right answers. Instructive patterns can emerge by conducting experiments that are safe to fail. This is the province of hypothesis and the scientific method. And then in the chaotic domain, cause and effect is, uh, is, cause and effect is in, unclear and events are too confusing to wait for a knowledge-based response. You need to act to establish order, sense where the stability lies, respond to the, uh, and, and respond and change these into chaotic or complex type domains. I'm oh, sorry, change the chaotic into the complex type domains. So this is the domain of firm leadership and tough decisions and action. So open source collaboration has proven to be very effective within the complex and the complicated domains, which begs the question of why, why is it so? Why is an open approach so effective within the complex domains? And conversely, why aren't open approaches as dominant in the obvious and the chaotic domains? Let's start by looking at the characteristics of open source. A study from the University of Massachusetts, which studied tens of thousands of open source projects, produced some really interesting findings. Firstly, most of the projects are abandoned and of those who succeed, most only have a few developers, with extra developers often coming from another country. So on this graph, I've drawn the success rate for projects. And as you attract developers, your chance of long-term success increases dramatically. This is showing ruthless Darwinian evolution at work. Effectively, open source is an environment where lots of competing ideas are tested and only projects of exceptional quality attract sustained growth and large communities. And this is a key characteristic to notice. When you are giving away your software for free, success depends upon a compelling vision, clear utility, and being so welcoming and caring that you attract and retain contributors. The study also noticed uh, the projects which grow tend to attract financial backing, typically providing fine scale task granularity, making it easier for people to contribute and often have attracted financial backing. And here we start to uncover some of the magic of open source. In the digital economy, there are more developers working in the rest of the, rest of the world on your problem than you will ever find in your own team. And when projects can tap into this, collaboration outcompetes competition. So let's have a look at one of the success factors of the complicated systems. That's trust. And let's question what makes trustworthiness. It turns, out, <clears throat> excuse me, it turns out that we all make use of a variant of this trustworthiness equation. We trust people who are credible and have a track record of providing reliable advice in the past. We trust people who are open and transparent. We trust ourselves, our family, our friends, because they look out for us and we look out for them. And we are suspicious of people who stand to gain from advice they give us. We also trust processes. We trust that the scientific method leads to reliable research that we should act upon. We trust that the collaboration of market economies leads, sorry, the competition of market economies leads to better products. And we trust that democratic processes lead to fair governments and the management of resources. But, but we also know that all processes can be gained. And the more complex a system, the easier it is to bamboozle people and to game the system. So part of the reason why open source has been so successful is that its characteristics lead to trustworthiness. These include freedom and altruism, 
openness, bottom-up decision-making, duocracy, meritocracy, and modularity. So let's look at these in more detail. Starting with freedom and authorism. Open source by definition is given away for free with the freedom to use and extend as you see fit. But why are open source developers so altruistic? It turns out that we're wrong to assume that we humans are only driven by self-interest. As noted by Dan Pink in his book, Drive, after our basic needs are met, we are also motivated by autonomy, the desire to be self-directed, mastery, the urge to get better at stuff, and purpose, the desire to do something with meaning and importance. Such, altruism, uh, su such altruistic motivated people who provide significantly more value to the receiver than to the giver increases the trustworthiness of the giver. Then there is openness. Openness and transparency is almost universally applied to all open source development and collaborate and communication. Conversations are public. Everyone has the opportunity to join and contribute. And decisions are made openly and issues and limitations are publicly are published and shared. So being transparent and open to public critique reduces the, pot the potential for hidden agendas and creates trustworthiness. And decisions tend to be made bottom up rather than top down. And when you can trust the motivations of your community, you're empowered to use this bottom up decision making. This is important because in a complex system, the person closest to the problem is usually the person best qualified to make the decision. It creates a culture of duocracy. Within a duocracy, the person motivated to do the work decides what gets done. Their commitment is a better indicator of true value than a person at the top saying, eh, someone should fix this. Um, and this leads to meritocracy. In a meritocracy, the best ideas win, no matter who suggests them. It is a sign of an egalitarian community rather than a hierarchical or dysfunctional one. But we should be careful not to suggest that open source easily solves all problems. Open source projects are highly susceptible to being loved to death. This happens when a project attracts an engaging user base without attracting matching contributions. Volunteers become overwhelmed, leaving insignificant, uh, sorry, insufficient capacity to cover essential business as usual tasks. Don't overload the community you depend upon. It is, it's both bad karma and bad business. Successful projects have worked out how to either politely say no to gifts of unsupported extra code and excessive requests for help, or how to help users become contributors either in kind or financially. So if your organization isn't ready to act as a good community citizen, citizen actively caring about the community's long-term sustainability, then you'll probably have a disappointing open source experience. You will make self-centered, short-term decisions, and you won't get the support you need when you most need it. You will likely be better off with proprietary software and the community would likely be better off without you. So a key strategy for managing complexity is to divide large systems into modular subsystems. So using modular architectures connected by open standards reduces the system's complexity, enables interoperability, which reduces technical risk. It enables collaboration and facilitates sustained innovation. It means you can improve one module without impacting the rest of your system. This helps with maintenance, innovation, and keeping up with the latest technologies. Collaboration is a key focus of both open source and open standards narratives, and hence the uh, successful open source applications usually provide exemplary support for standards. By comparison, from the perspective of a dominant proprietary company, it makes business sense 
to apply vendor locking tactics, making cross-vendor integration difficult. So adoption of open standards threatens the vendor locking tactics and consequently dominant vendors are often reluctant and half-hearted in their support of open standards. Effectively, we're talking about monopolies because, uh, because software is so time consuming to create and so easy to copy, it, it is excessively prone to these monopolies. This holds true for both proprietary and open source products. A product that becomes a little better than its competitors will attract users, developers and sponsors, which in turn allows that product to grow and improve quickly, allowing to attract more users. This highly sensitive positive feedback leads to successful projects becoming category killers. This means that most of the software you own will be out innovated within a year or two. Your software is not an asset. It's a liability needing to be updated, maintained and integrated with other systems. It is technical debt and unless you actually have a monopoly, you should try to own as little as possible. The question is, should you select a proprietary or open source as the alternative? Openness democratizes wealth and power, which is a good thing for all of us, even those with wealth and power. And open source and proprietary business models differ in how, they, how the realized value is shared. Open source licenses are structured that, such that multiple companies can use and support the same open source product. So the market self corrects any tendency towards price fixing. Effectively, open source licenses democratize information and that enables everybody to share in the value created by technology. But by comparison, the ruthless competition between proprietary company results in winner takes all scenarios. Many of the richest people in the world are self-made software entrepreneurs. These are typically people and organizations who've mastered the chaotic domain. So let's circle back and take a quick look at the indicators for successful open projects. One way, is, one way to get an insight into project health is to look at open hub metrics. In particular, look for signs of sustained collaboration and growth. Another strong indicator of project success is whether it has completed an open source foundations incubation process. I've been involved with the open source geospatial foundations incubation process where we've looked for indicators of quality, openness, community health, maturity, and sustainability. So if we bring all this together into a concise elevator pitch for your boss, the digital economy leads to high complexity, rapid innovation, and rapid obsolescence. Increased complexity requires us to trust. So increasing the place, the, the value we place on trustworthiness, openness, and transparency is very important. Software is technical debt. It needs significant maintenance to remain current. So we try to earn as little as possible. And for the long-term play, collaboration trumps competition. So truly care about your community because you want them to care about you and they'll care about you when you care about them. Learn how to describe the business case for this good behavior. It is counterintuitive, but it is a foundation for a long-term successful business strategy. And that's it. I'll flip over to Kobe just to uh, see if he's got any questions. Uh, yeah. any questions to come through. Thank you, so thank you. Uh, so attendees, I'll remind you um, that if you have any questions, uh, to use the Q&A and I will um, see those. So if you, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom, uh, you'll see a QA. and a um, click on that, type in the question, they'll come up uh, for me and I'll be able to, to ask uh, Cameron the question. Um, I, I, I've got a, a few uh, just from hearing and, and again, I, I appreciate the talk. 
um, a lot. Um, one was, uh, is, there, is there ever uh, a time where in, in open source um, software where the, the momentum dies, where there's less uh, contribution, and then how do you solve uh, that issue? Or is it not an, an issue at all, right? How do we keep open source moving forward at all times? Open source dies all the time. I'm not sure. It, it, I mean, if you look at the metrics of it, and, and, and the slide earlier showed some of this, the, the success rate of open source is really hard, and you really need to work on it. And, and um, it, it, is, it, it is very hard to think about the long-term success of a project, but that is exactly what is required to think about these things. We actually need to be able to motivate people to keep on working towards these things. Um, so it, it involves all the things of passion, thinking about people, caring about people, and, and putting in the extra mile, um, and, and listening, being kind, getting back to our, our, our core morals, the things that, you know, real hard stuff. Great. Um, so we, we have a question from the Q&A now. Um, are open source projects true meritocracies? Highly paid resource projects and developers can sustain their projects and branches of development longer than others. Yeah, um, and that is true. And, and it's, it's uh, I have been generalizing here uh, due to the amount of time that we've, we've gotten and how fast we've had to run through things. And at, at the, the, the far end of the spectrum, we've, we've got projects like Linux that have got thousands of developers working towards it. They're the exception. You know, the majority of the projects are right down with, they're, they're scrappy and where a project's DNA is actually forged is right at the start of the project when there's literally only, you know, three, five, maximum 10 people working on the project at a time. Um, and, and so, and, and at that point, quite a, most of these projects, people are, are not paid or it's part of their existing works that they're already doing. Um, so yes, as we get to the, the big projects, there are projects that are, people are getting paid and there, and there is a whole conversation around diversity and how we can in, increase and bring more diverse people into the decision-making process. And, and, um, that's something we need to work on. Um, probably one thing worth noting is that it's about the open source works really well when it can scale and scaling involves not having people who are excellent at it and only a few of them, but rather having lots of people who can do small amounts, which collectively makes a great thing. Um, and something like Wikipedia is probably the best example of that that, you, that that most people are familiar with. So Cameron, this is Charlie. Um, we had another question and it's kind of related, but um, can you explain um, in your experience how um, open source teams are financed? And uh, there may be multiple ways, but I think this is a key question that people have about open source. Um, do you have reactions to that or any any examples of how people are making a living through this open paradigm? Um, yeah, this is a this is a really hard question to answer because a lot of open source projects start out without without any financial backing and, and there is a tipping point the projects get to where um, you start off with a volunteer community and then you get to a point where you can't be sustained on volunteer um, effort alone. And some people start getting paid and then there is uh, there's potential for um, these people to be uh, the vested interests coming, coming on board. And uh, I've, I've seen quite a few projects reach a point of tension at that point um, as, as, as some people in the project, as they're getting paid, start to try and knock out the other competition so they can keep their, keep their turf and their expertise and, and um, these tensions arise. There's no easy answer to this. 
Um, the, the key thing is that open source is really effective for business. And if, uh, if people are using it, you know, um, Linux is used and Apache is used by, by the vast majority of businesses around the world. Um, if the business case is there, there's money there and it's working out how to, to make use of that. Terrific. I, probably should, I probably should add that it, a lot of it has to do with selling services rather than product per se. Yeah, so built around the services. Great, so we got um, another question for you. Uh, Nonprofit organizations seem to be going in the opposite direction. The project documents used to be distributed for free without restriction, allowing localization and adoption. They're now provided on a fee basis, copyrighted and IP protected due to the need for revenue generation. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and this, is the, the, this is a variant on this, the same theme, the same question. Um, one, of, one of the problems that people face is as we, as we get to a point where a project has a, um, a, a keeping a project running, just, just keeping the lights on, keeping the builds turning over, requires a lot of back-end work. And as, as a project grows, it needs to be resourced somehow. And volunteer work doesn't always cover all that. And so um, one of the ways people provide that is to um, pr provide services on top of that and sell those services. And sometimes they, they lock in the IP on top of that. And the, the, the buzzword is called open core, where the open source is free, but the product, the wrapper that sits over the top of it is quite often sold separately. Um, and look, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with a proprietary business model. You know, it, it's just a way to make money. Um, we, we all need to work out what works most effectively for, for our requirements. And one of the things we want to try and do is help describe the business case for doing things openly so that people will be able to financially back these, these cases. Cameron, if, this is Charlie, if I can interject, um, because I know you've been active in trying to get um, public policy around this in Australia for example. And so I guess my question is, is what, what do you see the role of government and, you know, the connection of government and open source? Yeah, so, so government has, uh, has the ability to greatly influence this because uh, government is a major purchaser of software. They, um, and, and collectively they, um, and then they also have a, a duty to, um, to the public to be able to provide the best value for money. Um, one of the challenges that the government face is that they will collectively get all the money into one location they will, through taxes, but then they spread it out through lots of small departments and each department is purchasing software individually and individually going in and negotiating for a, a deal on, on a, a project which is quite often a short-term project. The, the value of open strategies is usually a long-term play. And so what we need to do is help governments to be able to describe the long-term play and the collective play. And we should be aiming to get the governments to um, to be able to describe the value of collaboration in the when they are assessing projects, um, if you're going if you're going in and assessing two different projects, say, is this project going to be collaborating with the the government agency next to me? Are there other government agencies around the world who are going to be supporting this project with me? And we should only be backing the projects that are working collaboratively around the world, or at least around your country. Yeah, and this has been a, a personal uh, puzzle to me because I remember when I first started thinking about open source software more than 15 years ago, um, there was some initial um, collaborations of local governments in the United States. It was a handful, 
um, who were trying to build software as a commons um, that they would share and contribute to. And uh, that effort never played out. Um, it kind of ended. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm wondering if you've seen places where it seems to be, um, you know, taking off. Uh, I guess the one other place I've seen it, well, many, there are other places for sure, but the one that comes to mind, which isn't a, well, it's a, not really a government software, but is, our, is the Moodle system, the uh, course management system that many universities use, which is an open source platform. And that's one of the ones in my mind that's been more successful in that front. But it's been a puzzle to me why we don't see more um, governments at particular levels of government, whether it be local or state um, or, you know, province outside of different countries, why we don't see more collaboration in this front. Or, or, or are there at going on and I'm not aware of it? Um, it, is, it is happening. I, I have seen projects that have been successful. Um, and the ones that I have seen that have been successful is where there are very strong personalities involved and people are going in and using common sense over existing processes. Um, purchasing processes are, are, are typically very prescriptive in how they are working. And if we go back to the, the Kanban framework that I was describing earlier, um, typically what government processes are trying to do is they're trying to solve complex domains by defining a purchasing process. And it's very hard to go in and think of all the possible scenarios when you're purchasing something that's really complex. So what we need to do is, is, is encourage our government officials to be innovative and, and back these people and say, yeah, you know what? I know the process is not quite right, but common sense means that it's going to be better to collaborate. And we need to try and avoid these, these turf wars and in, enable people to, and, and where the government, where, where I've seen it work, I've seen government agencies just get together and say, hey, I've got a problem, you've got a problem. We both know that we're trying to solve the same problem. Um, we're going to get through the red tape and we're going to work out how we can co-fund this. It works on personalities. Interesting. So, Kobe, um, can we, or, or Cameron, can we stop sharing the slides um, so uh, attendees can see Cameron a little bit larger on the screen? And uh, attendees, um, I, I, we have a couple more minutes. If anyone else has any questions to ask Cameron before we break. Uh, so we have a we have a few here. Uh, one of one of which I think you may have, have just addressed. Here we go. Um, but but we'll, we'll bring it into the open anyway. Co uh, government public uh, purchasing policies are strongly antithetical to open source projects. The insurance, size of supplier, et cetera, requirements disqualify most open source vendors when a competing proprietary off-the-shelf application backed by a large private company already exists. Cameron, do you need that repeated or, or did you get it? Cameron, you there? Yeah, my, my internet just dropped out. Could you, could you share the, uh, the question? Yep, just, just checking in again, make sure you can hear. Looks like me, he may be having some internet problems. Hang on, attendees, and we'll hopefully get him back. Cameron, if you want, if you can hear us, you could stop your video. That might help with the bandwidth, and we'll just use voice. He may be totally out. <laughs> We did pretty well there, though. We got through uh, almost 40 minutes. So I think at this point, Kobe, we should probably um, assume yeah. he's not coming back. Yeah, now he's dropped out. Um, 
Huh? Go ahead. Are you seeing him joining again? Oh, oh there he is. Okay. All right. Are you back? Okay. So, uh, Toby, do you want to ask the question again? We have a couple more minutes. Yeah, and we got a, and we got a few questions. So uh, one of which, um, government public public purchasing policies are strongly antithetical to open source projects. The insurance, size of supplier, et cetera, requirements disqualify most open source vendors when a competing proprietary off-the-shelf application backed by a large private company already exists. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, my, my connection seems to be getting uh, flaky. If you can put the questions into the chat, I'll uh, be better in answering it. But okay, you're talking yeah, about yeah. Um, government policies being a bit average with regards to um, yeah, so you can actually scroll down and you have the advantage of being able to see the Q&A. There's the chat question, Cameron. No, I got it. Um, so some government policies are good. Um, there, was, there was a really good movement around open government five, maybe 10 years ago, and people were really starting to move in the right direction. The thing is, that the ideas are easy to understand, but the implementation is hard. And, um, and, and there's a whole lot of little things that actually need to be addressed from the government's point of view. And I think that what governments need to do, if, if we've got some government people listening here, is we need to actually go back and look at these issues um, and, and try and address them one at a time. Like there's just a simple, like one simple question or one simple issue is that governments have a tendency to purchase um, software at particular times in the year, just in their budgetary cycle. And that works really well for proprietary software because proprietary software can, can write the software and then sell it whenever. But when you... I was going to encourage him to turn his video off. I think we may have lost him again. Back. <laughs> Cam Cameron, turn your video off. Let's just go with your audio. Maybe that'll help. Okay. So you got cut off there a little bit. Um, you there? Yeah, back, back again. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> so, so I, th I think the the implementation of uh, from a government point of view of openness is is a lot harder than the policy. Um, getting the policy right is is good, and we've seen some really good policies in place. But there's a lot of things that we actually need to go in and do on uh, lots of little things we need to address. Um, and one of these is, is a really simple thing. Governments purchase their software at a particular time of year. And um, that works well for proprietary companies, but for open source companies that are selling services, it's a lot harder because they are forced to have to do all their work in you know, a month of the year um, where, where they're actually being asked to, to do the implementation. So Cameron, here, here's uh, another question in chat. The only governments I know of having preferential open source software purchasing policies are Russia and Brazil. What can the rest of us learn <laughs> from the long-term lessons, positive or negative? I've seen some really good policies come out of Australia. Um, 10 years ago, they, they had words where they said open source and proprietary software should be considered equally. Uh, the United Kingdom about 10 years had a policy which said that um, open source should be considered preferentially over, um, over proprietary. Um, so the policies um, are out there and are right. Um, they're, they're not universally applied across all governments, but um, there is the option to make it work. I've also seen that coming out of the United States Navy, um, they've written um, 
a, a really good purchasing guideline um, describing the benefits of um, the, the open community. Uh, some of them I've, I've worked, some of the people who wrote that I've, I've worked in with in the, um, in the geospatial space. So looking at the time, I think we're about out of time. Uh, we, as uh, many of the people who maybe have heard the introduction, I think we had at least one or two people join after the introduction. Um, this is the second in uh, a, a marathon of 24 webinars going on at the noon hour as the world turns. Uh, and we uh, are going to move now to uh, UTC plus 10 at the top of the hour. So um, we need to stop and, uh, and move to the next, get the next uh, webinar up and running. So um, I wanted to say, well, one, um, there was a post, Cameron, that said thank you for the thoughtful questions and answers to the questions. And I want to say on behalf of the International Association of the Study of the Commons and all of the World Commons Week organizers, um, we'd like to thank both the attendees and Cameron uh, for Shorter for preparing and giving this really interesting webinar. Um, as you can tell, Cameron is just a knowledge base in this particular area of common, software commons in this case. Uh, and I, I know Cameron, uh, this was a different community than, than you're often used to speaking to, but it was, I think you just did a wonderful job with it. And we're really grateful for the time and effort you put into it. Um, in closing, for the, uh, the attendees, I'd like to just remind people of two upcom upcoming IASC events, both of which are advertised at the top of the World's Commons Week web uh, World's Commons Week org, org website. Um, in November, the IASC is holding its first virtual conference. That's in the mid November, and there's still opportunities for to, to participate in that. And in July 2019, the ISC is holding its uh, biannual uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru in mid-July. And the deadlines for abstracts on those papers are due November 15th. Um, and this area, as I said in the opening, falls under what IASC sometimes called knowledge commons. So open source software is definitely a topic. Um, but um, in closing, on behalf of IESC and the World uh, Commons Week organizing team, we're really grateful for your time. And thanks again, Cameron, for your, uh, your great efforts to, to make this webinar a success. I appreciate it. I think with that, uh, Kobe, let's, uh, I guess, end the webinar. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.